We all love ourselves more than other people, but care more about their opinion than our own. So writes Marcus Aurelius to himself nearly 2,000 years ago in his personal journal that we now know as Meditations. It's clear to see that even the most powerful man in the world at the time struggled with his own thoughts about what others were thinking or saying about him. We've all experienced this, and the Stoics weren't immune either. What they did, however, was develop ways of thinking to lessen the burden that we place on ourselves from worrying about what others think, say, or do. In today's video, we'll learn more about these techniques and how you and I can apply them in our own world. My name is Fraser Brown, I'm the Stoic writer, and for the past 27 years, I've been overcoming adversity from chronic pain and a paralyzed arm. Most of us spend too much time worrying about what others think, say, or do. We're dedicating precious time to something that's out of our control, that we may even have wrong, and ultimately has no bearing on our lives other than what we impose on ourselves. For nearly 30 years, my left arm's been paralyzed. I've had to adapt the way I function because of this. Often this means I'll take a little bit longer to do even basic tasks. Things like getting my credit card out to pay for gas at the service station, eating a steak at a restaurant, or putting groceries into a basket at the local supermarket. I've seen the stairs as I try and cut that steak or I fumble getting my card out of the counter. I've even been called arrogant when I'd walk around in my left hand in my pocket when not wearing my sling. I know many others with my injury who feel very self-conscious about the way they look in public. I can't control whether my arm works or not, nor can I control what others make of my injury, but I can control how I let this affect me. Would worrying about what others say or think about me make my life any easier? Most certainly not. In fact, it's probably going to make things harder as now I feel the pressure of other people's eyes on me, which could ultimately lead to more attention. I know my situation better than anyone. I know how to cope best. I know what I'm doing is right for me. What others say or think has no bearing. I must stay the course. Again in meditations, Marcus writes, no matter what anyone says or does, my task is to be good. Like gold or emerald or purple repeating to itself. No matter what anyone says or does, my task is to be emerald. My color undiminished. Staying on our path when we know what we're doing is right and good for us and the common good is incredibly important, yet at times so challenging to do when we're easily distracted. We see others doing something in a different way to us and question whether we're going about it the right way. Other times people will flat out tell us that we're wrong without even knowing our circumstances or situation. When we know what we're doing to be right for us, we need to respect ourselves enough to stay true to our intent. We only know our story, we don't know the journey of others. How do we know the path they're on is even the right one? And if it is, are we sure it's the right one for us? I've had motorcyclists with the use of both arms come over and look at my setup for one arm riding and tell me that it's wrong or that they'll do it differently themselves. Also, those that have never experienced chronic pain, explaining to me how I should live with it. These people mean well, their intent is good, but their path is not mine. I know the way I manage my chronic pain and adapt to my physical needs work extremely well for me. These methods are good, they are right, and I will stick to them. Businesses have failed because they've stopped focusing on what they do well and instead try to emulate other companies, companies themselves that may be heading towards ruin. Relationships have suffered because we feel we need to change to what we think the other person wants or expects when we're swayed by our own misperceptions. When we know what we're doing to be right and good and our path is correct, we need to respect ourselves enough to stay true to ourselves, to not, as Marcus writes, let our colour be diminished. Too often we let our thoughts of what other people are thinking or feeling affect us. We imagine they don't like our company or find us annoying, when if we were to ask them, we'd find out that they do enjoy our company. Our own thoughts on what other people are thinking or feeling can be misleading. As Seneca writes, we suffer more in imagination than we do in reality. If we start imagining that we know what other people are thinking or feeling, we could be potentially creating our worries from nothing. Epictetus writes, when the force of impression first hits you, don't let it knock you off your feet. Just say to it, hold on a moment, let me see who you are and what you represent. Let me put you to the test. He's telling us not to base our understanding off our initial thoughts, that we need to put that impression to the test and not make assumptions. We may be misunderstanding what has been said or felt by the other person. 
don't be afraid to seek clarification so that you really understand what's going on, so assumption doesn't knock you off your feet. And what of the people that judge or criticise us so harshly? Are we even sure they're the type of person whose opinion we should care for? Marcus again writes in Meditations, Enter their minds, and you'll find the judges you're so afraid of, and how judiciously they judge themselves. Adding, When you face someone's insults, hatred, whatever, look at his soul, get inside him, look at what sort of person he is, you'll find you don't need to strain to impress him. It's not uncommon for those who judge us so harshly to also recognise fault within themselves, but are incapable of addressing it. Instead, they find it easier to point out these flaws in others, too afraid to face their own faults. And if someone criticises, ridicules or rebukes us, look at that person, see if they are the sort of person you would seek approval from. Those that criticise often come from a place of anger or insecurity. Is that the sort of person you want applauding you? In a chronic pain group I'm active in, I've often been criticised for my belief that a positive mindset can help with living with chronic pain, one person going as far as calling me a creep. When I looked into this person's activity in the group, I found them to be the type to constantly complain about their life and blame everyone else for their situation. Certainly not the sort of person that I want praise from. And what of recognition? Does recognition make our actions any more worthy? Does a lack of recognition take away from our good work? Should we prize recognition from others? In meditations, Marcus tells himself no, that the clapping of an audience is no more than the clacking of their tongues, which is all that public praise is, clacking of tongues. So he asks himself, what should we prize if not recognition? He suggests, and I agree, that we should prize what we're designed to do, the nurseryman who cares for the vines, the horse trainer, the dog breeder, this is what they aim at. To prize anything else, he argues, is to never be free, independent and imperturbable, because you'll always be envious and jealous, afraid that other people will come along and take it all away from you. When I first started my podcast on my journey with chronic pain and a paralysed arm, I laid out some ground rules for myself, one of which was how I would define success, which was by doing what I set out to do, making a podcast that I was happy with and uploading it. However, I must admit, in the early days, I allowed myself to be swayed by the number of downloads. If the numbers were up, I felt great. If they were down, I felt worse. I was letting my success be determined by something that was outside of my control and something that could be taken away from me at any moment. Now I very rarely, if ever, look at the numbers. Success is simply gauged by my efforts. Having never tried podcasting before, the idea of putting myself out there among seasoned professionals was daunting to say the least. I felt that I might look like a fool. But it soon occurred to me that no one starts out as an expert. As Epictetus writes, if you want to improve, be content to be thought foolish and stupid. Given time, I started to become more comfortable and confident behind the mic, and it felt good to let go of the burden of worry about how polished the first few episodes were, because I was getting better, I was growing, and growth always feels good. Too often we're afraid to do what we want because of the fear of looking foolish in front of other people and what they will think, but we can't let this stop us. So what if we stumble and fall and people laugh? Do you think they're going to remember who you are or recall your face? And even if they do, how will that affect your life? I'm sure we've all witnessed a stranger do something stupid or foolish or make a mistake. Can you remember who they are? And even if you can, what power does your memory hold over their lives? I'd wager that most people are too preoccupied with their own lives to even notice us or recall specific details. That's the important thing about being self-conscious, the self part. It's us that notice the things that we don't like about ourselves because we focus on them. It's us that remember our mistakes because we experience the sting. Don't let the fear of failure in front of others and what they may think stop you from doing what you want because most people aren't even thinking of you. And what about those that will tear us down or criticise us with no regard? Marcus makes mention of these people in the following passage. When you run up against someone else's shamelessness, ask yourself this. Is a world without shamelessness possible? No. Then don't ask the impossible. There have to be shameless people in the world. This is one of them. We can't avoid interactions with people that will criticise or judge us harshly. That is impossible. But we can control how we let it affect us. Instead of feeling harmed, find a way to remain indifferent to their behaviour so you can move forward with your day unaffected. As Marcus again writes, choose not to be harmed and you won't feel harmed. Don't feel harmed 
and you haven't been. If we're not to base how we see ourselves in the thoughts of others, their opinions or recognition, then it must come from within. In Meditations Book 2.6, Marcus writes, Everyone gets one life. Yours is almost used up. And instead of treating yourself with respect, you have entrusted your own happiness to the souls of others. We must be firm in our beliefs that what we are doing, when right and good for us and the common good, is right for us. To not be swayed by the opinions or thoughts of others, those that don't know us, don't know our journey, or whose opinion we shouldn't care for in the first place. Tranquility comes when you stop caring what they say, or think, or do. Not to be distracted by their darkness, to run straight for the finish line, unswerving.